There are many different ways that scientists collect data in the Great Lakes region and specifically the watershed and lake that you're looking at. There is water quality data that can be collected either a grab sample, which is just taking some water out of the river, um, you know, the right location in the river and then analyzing it back in the lab, or continuous monitoring where you have samples taking um, many times automatically over the course of a day and then analyzed back in the lab. And those two different methods, you can see that one, if you just happen to sample not quite the right place or not quite the right time, you might have missed a big rain event that happened. But if you're continuously monitoring, then you're going to have a higher quality data sample that you have more confidence in. Some data is derived from satellite imagery, which can be a very complicated thing, analyzing satellite imagery and determining, for instance, where is an algae bloom or what land use is in a watershed. Um, but we use a lot of data in our field that is spatial data that would look like Google Maps, perhaps, and would have been derived from satellite imagery. One other sort of data that's very important is knowing the flow of rivers um, that go into the lake. Stream flow is the amount of water, the volume of water, that's running through a river and um, over time. So if you talk about a high flow river, then it's going to look very big and be moving quickly, or at least one of those, and a low flow river would be um, shallower or moving very slowly. Flow data has been measured for a long time by the U.S. Geological Survey. They've done a really good job throughout the U.S of monitoring flow at many different locations over very long periods of time. And these measurements are very important for us. If we do have information about water quality, it's usually a concentration. Um, it's how much phosphorus is in this tiny little sample here. How do, you, how do you get to the scale of, well, how much was really in the river? Well, you have to know the concentration in this little bottle, and then you can multiply by the flow to know what was happening in the entire river. Um, and those sorts of measurements are critical for us to get our models right and to understand the systems um, and the processes going on in the lake. And so the first step is getting all these different types of information. That some of them might be a map, some of them might be a point measurement, all into the same, uh, same network, same system. So that's the first stage required for modeling. And just that process uh, initially starts to show you some patterns that you might not have been able to see uh, with all those data sets separate. Now once those, those are all in a, uh, you know, a geographical relationship and a time relationship to each other, then you can extract uh, patterns that, that have changed over time. And if you, uh, if you can understand those patterns and the interactions between the different parts of the system well enough, you can eventually actually forecast and model into the future to understand systems like the Great Lakes and to see patterns between the great, different Great Lakes or within a lake of what's really going on, you need a lot of monitoring data. It's one thing when you have a large algal bloom. You can see it, it's green, and it's bothering people because it's washing up on their shore or affecting their fishing. But there are a lot of things that happen that are negative in ecosystems that you can't see very easily. Or even if you see it, you don't know why it's there. And so monitoring Heavy monitoring in these systems is really important. Monitoring in the right locations, getting the right sort of data, and even looking for things that you weren't looking for in the past. So most data comes in the form of you know, what you might see in a spreadsheet or a table, just columns of numbers. And most of us can't just look at the columns of numbers and, and see those patterns quite as clearly. We've got to have some way of, of visually plotting it out. The next step is then to say, you know, I have to get this data into a format that I can look at something, you know, either a 2D plot or a 3D map. We use database processors like Excel, we use computer codes to look at things statistically. Um, there are many techniques that we can do to see how our water quality data changing over time. So one of the things that we can do very easily is just plot the data over time or in relation to other sets of data to try and understand it. Um, we can go beyond that and try to understand are there any mathematical relationships between the data that we can understand or help us understand the data better. The numbers tell you only part of the story. So a lot of social scientists will complement this data by interviewing people to try to understand why they are polluting the water, for instance. So while a number will tell you that there is uh, an amount of phosphorus in the water and an amount of nitrogen in the water, 
you try to understand what their motivations are. So you go and you talk to a farmer, for instance, and try to understand what are the incentives or disincentives to use different kinds of inputs that might end up in the water. So scientists who are looking to study a particular problem or a particular question, they've gathered data. Now they need to organize that data and look for patterns and look for relationships to see if different variables change in relationship to each other. An example might be global temperatures over time along with the amount of sea ice that's in the Arctic. And they might want to see if over time are there changes in temperature and are there also changes in the amount of ice in the Arctic. So they might have a graph, a scatter plot, for instance, at which they've got a time series here. And this, these numbers on the bottom might represent temperature. And over here, we might have percentage of the Arctic Sea that is, or the Arctic Ocean that is frozen over and covered with ice. And then they're going to look and see if there's a relationship, if there's change over time. And if they seem to be traveling in the same direction, in the opposite direction, or if there's no relationship at all. So if we look at these three sample scatter plots, you can see different types of relationships or a lack of a relationship. In this scatter plot, there's no clear pattern. The numbers don't really seem to have a relationship to each other. So I've got this X and Y point here and this one over here. I can't really visualize anything happening here in comparison to, say, this one. This is a pretty clear relationship. This would be called a positive correlation. What a positive correlation is, is as these numbers increase, these numbers typically increase too, right? So these numbers are related. As one gets bigger, the other one gets bigger. So I could draw a line sort of through the middle of these numbers. This is my closest fit line. And it shows a very clear, direct, positive correlation. I'm going to talk about correlation and causation in a second. It doesn't mean that x causes y or that y causes x. It means that they are traveling in the same direction together. As one goes up, the other one is going up. So the examples in this one might be as the amount of rainfall increases, the amount of runoff into lake systems also increases. That's a pretty logical connection. You get more water falling down from the sky. You get more water running off and washing things into lakes and streams. This over here is a less clear relationship, but still, if you follow kind of the pattern and you look at where they're clustered and you draw a line again, there are statistical ways to make this really fine-tuned, but just visualizing, there's kind of a line that goes through here. And the general pattern here is that as one variable increases, the other one seems to decrease. So an example of this type of relationship might be as global temperatures increase, the amount of the Arctic that's covered by ice is decreasing. As one number goes up, the other one goes down. That's an inverse or a negative correlation. So these are some of the types of relationships that scientists look for to try and figure out the relationships between different variables. Once they've established that there is or isn't a relationship, then they have to ask more questions. If I were to see this relationship between two variables as one goes up, the other one goes up, then I need to do more research. I need to ask more questions, gather more data, and also just think. Is there a logical connection between these two variables? Does it make sense that one going up causes the other? Correlation is not causation. Because they're related doesn't mean they cause each other. However, they might. Again, so scientists do more research to try and establish that. In the instance of, let's say, the relationship between global temperature, global average surface temperatures, and the amount of the Arctic that's covered with sea ice, that's a pretty logical connection. It makes sense that as things get warmer, more ice melts. That's very logical. So you can begin to make some assumptions about causation, but then you would still do further research to try and figure out exactly what's going on, and also to see if there are other variables that are at play that are changing this complex relationship.